Good evening and welcome to Driver's Ed, the remote classroom that uh, will get you your license in five to six weeks. So welcome to Driver's Ed. Hopefully people will uh, be clicking on soon. Yeah, we got three people looking. So welcome. It's going to probably take us a little extra time this evening compared to other nights that we have class. Uh, since this is something that's new, it looks like we've got 11 people uh, tuning in right now. So what I'd like you to do, and this is how we're going to start every class. You'll hear me repeat this quite often. In YouTube, there is a comment box. So what I'd like you to do is to put your name in the comment box so I know that you're here. And then what I want you to do is to text me your name. All right, now do the comment box first. We'll deal with the phone a little bit later tonight. So do the comment box. If you had looked over your sheet that I provided you when you went to uh, pick up your textbook, this is what was included with your textbook. It really explains how we're going to make this happen. This isn't really like Zoom uh, because I'm not going to be able to see you. Hey, Nico. Hey, Cole. Sophie, good. People getting the hang of it now. Now we're almost up. We got 15 people. The other thing that is a little bit difficult for me is because there is a lag. So even though you're making the comments, I'm, I'm not able to see things right off. So I apologize that it's not real time that we're going to be able to have this back and forth. So I think we just about just about have everybody here. Um, let me get something else up here. Let's see if this works. Let me get, there we go. The other thing that I wanted you to do was to subscribe to Toll Driving School Facebook. Okay, and that's on the sheet right here. Some of you have already done that. Let me show you, let me bring this up into the screen. If you go to Toll Driving School, You'll see it under post. If you go down, oh, probably three or four posts. I've had three or four posts since I made this one. You, you'll see that here is a link to join the private driver's ed class. So that's you. Okay, that's just you being in this class. Now, I'm going to delete the people from my last class. I haven't done that yet. So you're going to be the current class. And what will happen is I will post worksheets, some homework. Um, oh, wow, I can make that smaller. I didn't know I could do that. I'll leave that up here while I talk about it a little bit. So if you take a look at your sheet, let's just deal with tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to be talking about what is a safe driver in the HTS. HTS comes from the textbook, Chapter 1. So what I'd want you to do for your homework would be to read chapter one and do the questions and to read section one. Let me get this out. Section one out of the, the state manual. So the textbook and the manual is what we're going to be using for class, but we're pretty heavy on discussion. Uh, that's how we run the class. Now you're only going to see me face to face uh, partially. What I do is I bring in my PowerPoint and I talk over it and I have videos that I can link into what we're discussing and what we're topic, uh, talking about. And that's basically how we're going to run the program. Over in the comment section, probably every 15, 20 minutes, I'll ask you to make a comment. Something to do with a video that we're watching, something about what we're discussing, just that I know that you're still here and you're active. The only way that I can tell that you're here is by looking at this little eyeball on top of my 
screen right here that's letting me know that we've got 20 people that are tuning in. So that's basically uh, what you'll see when you come in to the class at 8 o'clock. So if you subscribe to Peace, Love, and Safe Driving, I believe they're going to send you a notification of the upcoming class. Now, I got home around 6.30. I came to the computer and I typed in what we were going to discuss tonight. So the YouTube channel should say Introduction to Driver's Ed. I believe that's when they will probably send it out to you. So what you see in your homework or your syllabus of what we're going to discuss will be uh, what will be the live stream boot that you can click on to get to where we're at. The other nice thing about this particular platform that I like a lot is that if for some reason you can't make class, it is recorded. You could come back to it at 10 o'clock tonight. You could come back to it tomorrow uh, on the weekends and, and see what we covered online and still get credit for it. But what I'd like you to do if you do that is just text me and let me know that you're not going to be here for the live version of class and that you're going to do it, let's say, tomorrow morning. And tomorrow morning, what I'd want you to do is to text in at 9 o'clock. I'm logging on. I'm watching. And then during the video where I'm asking questions, you're going to answer that and text that to me. Now, I'll probably t tomorrow at 9 o'clock, I'm with another driver. I'm not going to respond to your text messages, but at least I know that you're actively watching it at a later time. And that's the whole thing. So that's the only way that we're going to be able to get conversation back and forth is through the comments that you leave here on the YouTube page and by texting me the information that we go over. So this is my cluttered office. This is where we're going to have class. I've got some lights and usually I have a green screen behind me, but I'm working on that. And I can turn this on and off so when we're watching a video, I can take that right off. So basically, this is where we're going to have class. And everything is in conjunction with what the state wants you to know in order to do well on a written test for your driver's license. So there is a New Hampshire driver's ed curriculum. I have taken bits and pieces of that curriculum and I've tweaked it a little bit to make it more suited for my style of teaching and hopefully to make it a little bit more interesting for you. Um, and I, w I want it more than just reading and writing. I want you know to talk about things that are going to be important to you as a, a new driver, maybe stuff that your parents probably haven't covered or at least haven't covered in depth. So that is basically what we have. Um, I think we probably should get the paperwork out of the out of the way first. So I know some of you have um, already sent me a copy of your birth certificate. Some of you gave me a copy the day you picked up the textbook. So that that's good. But some of you haven't. So at some point tonight, tomorrow, this week, okay, I want you to send me really preferably tomorrow a copy of your birth certificate. I want you to text me a copy of it. The other thing that I want you to do is get out the piece of paper that I sent home with you. So on one, the first part was the curriculum and on the second was what we call a driving log. So what I'd want you to do right now is to get out this driving log and print in your best penmanship Okay, your last name, first name, middle name, not middle initial, middle name. Uh, class session is June 23rd to July 30th. We'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Write down your birth date, male, female, your phone number, your parents' phone number. I need your address with the street name, number, city, state, zip code, and then your email. Okay, I think some of you used an email that might have been your parents when they signed up for Eventbrite, but I want your email in case I have to send you something a little bit more complex than what we do through, through Facebook. So I want everybody to do this right now. I'm going to give you about five minutes to finish this out. And then what I want you to do is to get in a well-lit area 
and take a picture. Take a picture of this being filled out. All right. So I need your legal information. Anything that's wrong on this, this is the information that I'm using in the next two days to send to the state to let the state know that you are now involved in driver's ed. So we are priming the pump for you to get your driver's license. Anytime that you give me wrong information, there's going to be a bump in the road. It could take longer to get your license. So make this as accurate is possible and that's why I want a copy of your birth certificate so I can kind of match it up with what you are giving me tonight so I'm gonna turn on just a little bit of background music here just so that you can do it so I'm looking at my clock it says 815 so I mean 810 so at 815 we're gonna come back and you are going to have that completed and you are going to text that to me all right so Please fill that out. Okay, make sure that you're taking a good picture that I can really see the whole sheet because I don't want it to uh, obscure any of the information. So far, everything is looking pretty good that people have sent in. So I'm going through them relatively quick. Although Theo, whoever Theo is, Theo, I need you to fill that, that form out.
Okay, try to wrap it up. We're almost to the time allotted for doing this paperwork. One of the problems with Eventbrite is that when you uh, sign up to, to register, they don't have any spot for what your middle name is and the state needs to know because it's a legal document. In about a year, there's something called a real ID that they're going to use and it has to be pretty accurate. And so it has to be in line with what your birth certificate is. So birth certificate, driver's license, everything has to match up. So that's why I'm trying to make sure that I've got everybody writing down all this, this information. And also to make it a little bit easier to, I appreciate the um, taking a, a shot of this driving log paper, but if you could also just text me, just again, your full name, just in case I can't read it, uh, that would probably be helpful too, because I'm just scanning through some of it now as they're coming in. Um, I'll be able to blow it up on my desktop here a little bit, but... So if you could do your full legal name, that would be really, really helpful. So I am going to get right into the PowerPoint. So this is a class. So what you need to do is to come at 8 o'clock with a notebook, a pen or a pencil, and have the state manual and the textbook with you. Whether we get into the manual or the textbook page by page, it depends on the subject that we're going to be covering. But usually, I am going to say this is important information. So if I'm saying it's important, highlight it in your state manual or write it down in your notes. And that's what you can use. So the homework does count. You have to have the homework in in order to take your exams. There are two exams. One's a midterm, halfway through, and then one is going to be a final. I do a lot of worksheets. I do some... Uh, chapter reviews from the responsible driving textbook, but mostly your homework is going to be just 12 or 15 questions right at the end of the chapter, multiple choice, fill it in. Very easy to do. Shouldn't take you more than five minutes if you've, if you've done the reading. Really easy to do. Uh, so most of our class sessions will take us to 9.15. The last 15 minutes will be for you to um, review your notes, go through the textbook, and answer those review questions and send to me. So if you take a look at tomorrow, uh, chapter one, questions, section one, all that should be uh, handed in uh, sometime after tomorrow's class. Doesn't have to be before. It could be right after the class, uh, before the next class. Put it that way. It doesn't have to be right after. But just get it in before the next topic that we're uh, covering. So that's how we're going to do it. So let's kind of get into what we're going to cover for tonight. So I'll get out of here and get into, the, into our PowerPoint. So hopefully all of you have my phone number. So there it is, 973-9118. This is Toll Driving School. And we were supposed to be in a classroom from 9 to 11 on yesterday, yesterday. Okay. okay and, and that's, that's the way, way that we were going to have our program but because of the virus as you are well aware the school has continued to be shut down so even though you finished high school online the summer programs are continuing on in the same format so that's what i'm going to have for the remainder of the summer your class and the class right after this will be online um, I don't take random pictures of people. Uh, you'd think, why did I take a picture of that girl? Oh, well, I'm instructing. That is actually my daughter. That is my second child. So I um, had all my kids in driver's ed. Yes, they had to do the same curriculum that you did. They did not do it at home. Uh, they did it in a classroom. And actually, this is the only child that I had. Oh, there's an echo. That's one thing. When I switch over... This is a switcher. When I went from my picture to the PowerPoint, my built-in microphone. So please, in the comments, if you hear an echo, please let me know that you're not hearing things well. I'll try to take a look at, I've got so much stuff up on my screen right now, trying to, uh, to monitor everything. So I'll do the best that I can. But every once in a while, when I switch between movies, the PowerPoint, and my live picture, 
it goes back to a secondary microphone and then we get the echo. So, well, anyways, that's my daughter. She missed too many classes. She actually had to do um, half of one program and she jumped in into the second half of the second program. So the state does want you to be actively involved. So please be here at eight o'clock, um, stay the whole time. Like I said, if you can't make it, please watch it as soon as you possibly can before the next class because they basically build upon one another. So tonight is really an introduction to driver's ed, what to expect. We're going to go through the dates. Uh, most of you paid, some of you have not. Uh, I'll be collecting that. Uh, you can either send it in by mail or if we start driving and my hope for driving will be third or fourth week of your class, I will probably have some holes to start driving with people. But I am a good, oh, 250, 280 hours behind in driving because the two months that they made us stay home, I was continuing to teach class and start new classes. So everybody is piled up. The permission slip your parents basically signed when they signed up for the program. So if you need a copy of that, I'll put that in the Facebook pages. So if you want to download it or your parents need it again, they can find it there. Uh, you can download it for them. And tonight we're getting copies of birth certificates or tomorrow as soon as possible. Because whenever you do start driving with me, I do need record of that in case we ever get stopped. The police will ask for my registration of the driver's ed vehicle, my license, and your birth certificate because you are driving as a new driver or a learning driver uh, and you can't be out on the road unless you're 15 and a half. And I was looking through some of the birth dates and I see, I forgot who it was, but someone just snuck in. I think it was uh, Evie just got in on... Uh, the 23rd of June is three months from her birthday. So hopefully there's nobody with a birthday later than September 23rd. Because if your birthday is the 28th of September, you really can't be in this class. Okay, you can only take it three months prior. So I think we're okay. I think we squeezed one last person in. So that's good. There's the dates to the class. Um, we will be meeting every night. Uh, Monday through Thursday from 8 to 9.15. And then, like I said, the last 15 minutes would be for you doing work, um, getting things ready, and handing it in to me. Because usually when there's dialogue in a class, um, I can make it stretch to about an hour and a half. But when it's just me talking, going over content, it, it, goes, it goes pretty quick. And I just don't want to keep you here any longer than that you have to. I want to get you the information and then move on from there. Some of these PowerPoint slides were for the classroom, and I don't have the videos quite logged into this desktop computer. So when we do get to some slides, we may not to be actively watching the video. If I was to ask your parents, why do they have you enrolled in driver's ed? They would probably say, because I don't want them to ruin the family car. If I was to ask you why you're here for driver's ed, one, you'd say, because I have to. The state's telling me that I need to come to this in order to get my driver's license. But basically, you want that driver's license for freedom. You basically want to be able to go where you want to go, when you want to go, with who you want to be in the car. You're sick and tired of asking your parents, asking for friends, to get rides and sometime that urgency of getting a license you forget that there are components to being a good driver that has to be instilled at a young age because you never take driver's ed again even when you're in your 30s and 40s if you have a lot of tickets a lot of crashes they really don't send you back to a uh, a full-fledged driver's ed program this is your one-shot deal so we got to make it count, uh, and, this, and the state wants it to count. And by the way, once you get your license, the state won't even retest you till you're in your 70s. So you're going to be driving like 50 years, and who knows how the laws are going to change. Um, and that's why people are having a hard time adapting to things on the road, because they just don't learn anymore. They don't actively try to seek out that information. 
So the state has made a requirement besides driver's ed that you need to have 40 hours of practice with a parent. 10 have to be done at night. And I forgot who texted me um, tonight, but they said that they didn't get the 40 hour log link. It didn't really work or something like that. I am going to try to make a link on the Facebook page or at least a copy of the 40 hour log. So if you want to download it from the Facebook page later, I'll try to get it in before tomorrow's class. You can do that. Now I think I, I'm going by my last couple of classes. Most people that I go out to drive with for the first time, they tell me they've done some type of driving, which is good, but it's not mandatory for taking driver's ed, you have to have like 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, whatever, uh, in order to take driver's ed. But it does help you get that license quicker if your parents are helping you get behind the wheel of a car and driving for these 40 hours. And I'll try to do my darndest to get you done with those 10 hours as quickly as I possibly can. To be honest with you, it's probably going to be probably the second week of August for most people, maybe some people a little bit before that, but it's going to be hard, but we'll see what happens. So if we go to the 30th, which we will, uh, we'll have uh, accomplished the 30-hour requirement. Uh, we'll do the best we can with the 10 hours that you need to do with me. And I'm going to get out of here for a second. Let's see if I can get back to me. Your parents are going to take over the observation. So I have made a form. Okay, it's really hard to see with the camera. Observation requirement of remote driver's ed. So the state does requ uh, require your parents to sign off on this saying that you have done observation with them. I know, don't ask me why. Why do they make, you've been observing them since you were a little kid, since you can remember, why do I have to sign this off? If you take a look at the sheet that I provide, it, it kind of explains how they should actively be asking you questions and doing things for observation. So if you were in the driver's ed vehicle and you are observing, and I'm going to pick on Cole because uh, I saw his name. I'm going to say to Cole who's observing, Cole, uh, what should we be doing at this uh, intersection up ahead? And he'll say, well, it's a stop sign, so we got to stop, and it's a four-way stop. we got to check the other three signs. we got to figure out who has the right of way. So that's how I handle observation. I may ask a question. And he explains what he sees, what he thinks is going to happen. That's basically what your parents should be doing to you. Now, I know when you drive with your parents, they're driving. You're just watching what they do with their hands, their feet, and their eyes. But there probably isn't much dialogue going back and forth. So the state really wants that to kind of take place. So do the best that you can. If you, As long as you sign it and date it, that's really all I care about. And I'll just put it in your file and you're going to be good to go. So that's, that's what we're going to do with that. Um, please do not be late, uh, for driving. Um, so if you don't show up, there's going to be a $30 fine. I've only had to charge that once, um, in the last couple months. And actually to, to tell you, um, I made a screw up and I gave a student $30 because I made the mistake. So I don't want to be waiting at the school for someone to show up to drive and they just blow me off to go swimming. Um, because I'm stuck in a hot car and I'm not driving and I've got, a, like I said, over 200 hours of driving to do. I want to be very um, judicious with giving out drive times to those that can actually um, keep that time commitment. So do not sign up for a driver's time. Write this down. This is important. Do not sign up for a driver's time that doesn't fit your schedule that you cannot make. I am not making you drive Thursday at 3 o'clock. You're asking, Mr. Toll, can I drive Thursday at 3 o'clock? We're going to come into an agreement, and we're both going to be there. Now, I know things come up. So accidents. There was an accident this morning where I had to um, show up late to a student. He knew I was going to be five minutes late, okay? So he wasn't worried. I wasn't standing him up. So please let me know. And I need to know basically minimum four hours, minimum four hours. Okay. Now, most driving schools, if you don't give them 24 hours, they're going to charge you. This is the lowest fine. I looked at one driving school. They were charging $100 for a missed driver's appointment. That's crazy. So try to keep it. And don't forget, 
be here for the classes. You're going to be okay. Don't worry about the, the tardy stuff. Um, when you come to drive, make sure that you have glasses, correct shoes, cell phones uh, should be on vibrate or silent. I don't want you to be disturbed or actively trying to turn off your phone. Um, you're at your house, so don't have to worry about books and materials because you're going to already have them there. And we've already talked about being on time. Uh, the total cost of the program is $675. You've already paid $50 for your registration. For those of you that have not paid by check, uh, please do so. Like I said, probably by the third week. If we start driving, I could probably collect it then. If not, you can mail it to me. Um, and I don't know if I've got my address in what I gave you. So, well, anyways, we'll get it halfway through after the midterm. We'll leave it at that. So don't worry till the midweek, midweek, um, midterm week. Then I'll probably collect it then, and I'll find out who hasn't paid and go from there. So a little bit about me. I've been doing this for a long, long time. I've been doing this for 35 years. Not all the time full-time. Sometimes it was part-time. Uh, I worked for the state of New Hampshire, their first offender DWI program for five years. And I've served on various state of New Hampshire traffic safety boards and associations. So I like to bring current information to my program because I think that's gonna make you a, a better driver, a safer driver, more informed driver. Um, and I'm always learning things, so I wanna bring that to my program. Rather than keeping a program that the state, and by the way, the curriculum that they gave us haven't, hasn't really changed probably in the last seven, eight years. The state manual has changed slightly. There's a few laws that have changed slightly, but for the most part, um, the curriculum and the modules that they have has has stayed the same oh if you hear motorcycles i apologize i live very close to an intersection with a stop sign so when they come to the stop sign they love to rev their engines and tonight i have the window down a little bit because it is very hot with these lights um i went to a conference probably about four years ago and i met this individual andy pilgrim and he was a IT guy that was a race driver. That was his um, hobby. And uh, he did so well with his IT company, he sold it, and he got into racing full-time and uh, education of training new drivers. And he's come up with a program called the Parent Driving Zone. So what I've done is I've chopped up his DVD that he provided all the driving instructors, and I'm going to show you a few clips about um, learning to drive and how to get your parents involved. So after tonight's video, if anything looks like something you want your parents to be aware of, of how I teach and what I want to accomplish and cover, you could always go back to YouTube and take a look at this rather than looking up Andy's video. And Andy's video is on YouTube. So here's Andy and let him introduce himself. In 1989, I started an IT consulting business in South Florida. And in 1998, I became a US citizen. I'm probably best known as a professional race driver and have been racing for over 27 years. So far in my professional racing career, I've won five championships and over 60 races. My sports car career has spanned driving in one hour sprint races up to 24 hour races and all over the world. I was even fortunate enough to run the 24 Hours of Daytona with NASCAR legends Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr. in 2001, and several NASCAR road course races since then. On the education side, I've been speaking about the dangers of distracted driving to high school students since 1994. The most important link between race driving and driving on the street is concentration and paying attention. I have to use all my concentration while racing and at all times in my street driving. We all know that having a driver's license does not automatically make someone a good and safe driver. I produced the Driving Zone 2 DVD in 2011 to help driver education teachers with new information they can use in the classroom. This information is totally up to date and addresses the knowledge new drivers desperately need to help them survive the early years of street driving. Thousands of copies have been requested so far by public school driver education teachers and my foundation has given them away at no charge to the schools or the teachers. 
I work to educate new drivers because too many of them are having collisions and crashes and many with fatal consequences. That does not have to happen. I know that knowledge and education definitely helps. Along with using my own driving knowledge and skills, I've gained information from speaking with thousands of young people and parents. I have also spoken with many other driving professionals such as police officers and driving education experts, including people from the NHTSA and highway experts at other federal agencies. This production brings all the best data I have gathered over the years together with the most up-to-date knowledge and information available. In order to get the most out of your time here, please make sure you've turned your phone off before we continue with the let me explain how I... So that's um, a brief introduction of, of Andy and why he got into this program. What I want you to write down in your notes, and this is going to come up uh, later, probably on the midterm or the final, he talked about collisions and crashes. So write down collisions and crashes, not accidents. That's really important to understand. When you say the word accident, you're giving away that you had any responsibility or someone else had some responsibility. A crash is when one object hits another object. Same thing with a collision. There are ways to avoid being hit. And that's what we want to accomplish with driver's ed is how can we make you a better driver to know that you can change your position, change your speed, beep your horn, flash your lights. There are multiple things that you can do to avoid being hit. You have to be actively avoid, uh, involved. You just can't you know, be driving and say it's always their fault. It just happened. It was an accident. No, you were going too fast. Or no, you weren't paying attention. So those things are extremely important to understand. So what I want you to write down is I want you to write down a term that would describe driving, that you have to be good at judgment, be a courteous driver, make better choices, be responsible, be aware. So someplace in the YouTube, so this, like I said, I'm going to ask questions. So someplace here in the YouTube comments, put down a word that you associate with safe driving, good judgment, being courteous, smart choices, responsibility. Doesn't, can't use these five, but some of the ones that uh, you're coming up with uh, can be repeated from other people that are going to put things here. I'm not looking for something unique, but just something that's different than what we have here. So I hope to see some come up on the YouTube message board in a moment. People often ask, how did New Hampshire come up with the age of 16 for driving? And why 15 and a half? is when we can start practice driving. And why can't we take driver's ed at that point at 15 and a half? Why do we have to wait till three months prior to our 16th birthday? Well, the answer to that question is just a random law that someone decided to enact. I have no idea. I've been pushing for years to have beginning driving at 15 and a half and driver's ed at 15 and a half rather than the three months prior to your 16th birthday. Uh, good. People are uh, coming up with a lot of good terms. I like that. Super. Can you drive a vehicle younger than the age of 16? Absolutely. There are a lot of people that are on farms that learn to drive when they're like 9 or 10. And I came across this news article where a 6-year-old boy, think about it, knew enough how to put the key in the car, how to turn the key to start the car, knew which pe pedal would stop the car or move the car, and how to get it in gear. A six-year-old boy was able to start the car, get the car on the road, and drive down the road. He was hungry. He wanted Chinese food. Now, how far do you think he got? Did he get to the restaurant and drive back? No, he crashed the car. There comes a point when you are going to be overcome with um, information, how to process what to do on the road, or lack of physical skills to maneuver a vehicle. So this is what I want you to write down. There are only three physical skills to driving. Braking, accelerating, and steering. You have a steering wheel, you have a gas pedal, you have a brake pedal. 
But the problem is how much do you turn the wheel? How much do you use the brake pedal or use the accelerator? That is what separates good drivers from bad drivers. It's like juggling. You got two hands, there's three balls. There's one ball always up in the air. When driving, one of those three things isn't being used. It's either the brake pedal or the gas pedal because you always have your hands on the steering wheel. So it's usually steering and braking or steering and accelerating. When do I go from the gas to the brake or brake to the gas? That is going to show me and show others that you're a good driver. But yeah, they could have, I mean, my nephews learned how to drive when they were 14 and a half. They grew up in Nebraska. They only had one flashing, they had one traffic light in the whole town. They had one supermarket and a subway. I, they were driving when they were nine or 10 and they were pretty decent with it. But you know what? When they came out to New Hampshire to visit and they had to drive the roads around here, they were overwhelmed by the amount of traffic, the traffic lights where everybody was coming from, people, pedestrians. The roads were bigger. They couldn't handle it, even though they've been driving farm equipment. So you don't have to write this down, but I want to kind of break this down because learning to drive is like learning an instrument, learning a sport. Any learning starts at a base, a core. So the lowest level of driving is assuming, assumption. And above that is knowledge, then understanding, then comes wisdom, which is applied knowledge, then practice, and then finally skill. So what we're trying to do is a progression of these attributes of driving. Anyone can know and understand something and even do it successfully once or twice. You give a person a basketball at the foul line, just because they make one basket at the foul line doesn't mean that they're going to take nine more shots and make all nine. They just made the first one. They were lucky. But usually, through routine, you can basically find who's going to be more successful. So a person that's been practicing foul shots, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shots, and if someone says, okay, I want you to take 10, you'd probably bet that he's going to probably make 7 or 8 out of 10. Whereas someone that never plays basketball may make the first one, in the second, and then he could miss the next eight. Driving can't be that way. When you're driving down the road, you've got to be good all the time. You can't be good just some of the time. So you're practicing these skills constantly. So the breakup or the breakdown of what we're doing in driver's ed is going to be continuous practice of sound driving technique. I like Sports, so you'll see a lot of quotes and things about sports. You don't practice something till you get it right. You practice something till you can't get it wrong. And this was Gino uh, Oriyama, uh, the women's basketball coach from UConn. I thought this was kind of neat too because I think you need to have a good attitude about driving. Those that come to drivers and wanting to learn, willing to learn, will learn. But those that are going to say, I already know how to do this, you know, this information, I'm never going to use it. Well, there's a chance that maybe not if you don't really dig down and deep into it and understand it. Um, but I kind of like how it took the alphabet and then added numbers uh, assigned to each letter. And the word knowledge came up with 96% and hard work came up with 98%. So it's good to have knowledge. It's good to have hard work. But you really need a good attitude, which is going to take you over the top. That's going to be 100%. And I always find my best drivers are those that are very willing uh, to learn and listen and apply what we learn here in class and out on the road. Um, why do we practice things? And I want you to write down this term. I want you to write down muscle memory. When you do something like file shots over and over again, you're training your, your arm and your legs to bend and to move at a certain degree with a certain effort. The same thing with driving, going into turns or merging or parking. That repetition is creating muscle memory. And one of my uh, favorite videos growing up was Karate Kid, and they did a remake, so I've got a little clip of the remake rather than the original. But, the, but there was an individual that was trying to, to learn karate because he was being picked on. And he found a sensei that was going to help him 
but he basically told him, what you've got to do is do some chores for me, and I want you to wax my car. So it was wax on and wax off, and he had this circular motion of putting on wax and taking it off. Well, in this clip, it's putting your coat on a coat rack. So let's take a, walk, a look at someone teaching someone uh, repetition. Oh, I didn't clip the movie. Let me get it here. There we go. Hand up your jacket. Take it down. Put it on. Take it off. I already did. Jacket off. Kung Fu, I've seen how we put on the jacket. Be strong. Take off the jacket. And I've seen how we treat people. Everything is Kung Fu. Get it off! <laughs> What I really like about that that little clip is at the very end when he looked at his arms and he, he's thinking, did I just do that? And his sensei is looking at him, nodding yes. See, that's why I'm making you do this over and over again is because you're training yourself to do it without thinking. It's almost like tying your shoe. If you've got a shoe on right now that has shoelaces, no one woke up this morning and looked at the two shoelaces and, and thought, okay, now what do I do with these? Do I go left or right? Do I go under? Do I go over? You just grab your shoe and you put it on. After tonight's class, ask your parents if they ever find themselves driving down the road not thinking about driving. You may think that's a funny question, but there are a lot of people, they are so used to driving and they're just keeping the car between the yellow line and the white line that their mind wanders all over the place. They're thinking about what they want to eat when they get home. They're thinking about, um, uh, you know, work that they've got to do uh, when they show up at the office. They're not thinking about looking at traffic lights, traffic signs, because they've gotten so accustomed to just maintaining speed and position that, and they've gone the same route over and over again. They're on autopilot. And now we're even building cars. And we're going to have a, something in class a little later about that. But we're building cars that are now... Uh, we got the technology to drive themselves. Okay, we want good muscle memory. Um, I'm not going to go through this bullet by bullet, but these are all topics that we're going to be covering in class. Um, I want to show another thing from Andy about learning to drive. So I'm going to click on this so you can see Andy explain the, um, the importance of learning certain driving skills. Permit year is when children actually start to drive a vehicle on the roads. They will be starting a learning process that never ends. All of the states have their own rules and laws regarding learner drivers. Some states allow new drivers to obtain a driver's permit at 14 and a half, others at 15, on up to 16. The states also refer to these driving permits in many different ways, as you can see here. Some states require these learner drivers to drive with a supervising adult passenger for six months, but most up to a year. The states also have different ages when a new driver can progress to a full or probationary license. To keep things simple, I'm going to refer to this very important learning time as permit year throughout this production, because most states require 12 months before a learner driver can progress to their full license. Please check the websites listed for more information. Every day, I learn something new about driving or see something happen on the roads I never saw before. If you think driving is boring, then you're not engaged enough in the driving process. Changes are constant on the roads, and it's the duty of all drivers to be ready. Being aware and prepared keeps drivers much safer over the years. Driver education teachers have mandated curriculums. They have to spend time on things such as laws, statistics, street signs, and road markings. My focus in the parent driving zone and the driving zone too is to provide an understanding of the dangers of distracted driving and provide information to help the new driver survive those critical early years. I want to make a few points before parents sign off on the driving permit. Remember, it is up to you to give permission to start the driving process for your child. When it comes to driving, the balance between laws and personal responsibility are provided by education, wise choices, and reasoned actions. Make sure your house is in order. If you know from watching The Driving Zone 2 and the prior information presented here that you have been guilty of distracted driving behaviors, 
then the very first thing I recommend is a sit-down session to address this with your child or children. You need to do this whether your child has shown interest in driving or not. Tell them you had never thought about many of the things you've learned here before and are going to change your distracted driving behavior. It's possible you had ignored good information and even the pleas of your own children to put your phone away. Please, never ignore your children if they bring up your distracted driving. I hear this from children of all ages these days. Remember, your children are not in your vehicle that much. The phone use and all driving distractions can certainly wait until you're safely parked. If you stick to your behavior changes, your child will see this and ultimately understand you are trying to change for them. It's never too late to set a safer example. In many cases, distracted driving behavior such as answering a phone, messing with papers or drinking coffee while driving has become automatic. Work as a team. Encourage your children to remind you and help you. Have your child turn your phone off or put it in the trunk or glove box for you. I do not think your child should be relaying phone messages or texts. Every time you are using the phone with a child in the vehicle, other than for an emergency, you are choosing convenience now over safety for your child later. Cut out all distractions, stay in the driving zone, and just drive. Parents need to know the laws regarding graduated licensing and the laws for the probationary driving periods after the permit year. The websites listed give information for all parents to help them find guidelines for their state. We are going to talk about the guardian principles of mobility. These are key words and principles that many driver educators, including myself, use to bring gravity and meaning to this lifetime career we all know as driving. Here are the principles. Judgment. You understand the power you possess while driving and your decisions will reflect this awesome reality. Courtesy. You think of other road users and will always be considerate. Choice. You understand you have a choice before making any decision behind the wheel. Responsibility. You own and are responsible for everything you do and don't do while driving a vehicle. Awareness. You know you have to be aware at all times to help you see the constant changes going on all around you. I strongly suggest you ask your child to come up with another word or principle that they can call their own. Many drivers I have spoken to come up with some great words and principles. The fundamental understandings of driving come up next. These fundamentals add gravity and reality to the driving discussion and are extremely important points. All new drivers should appreciate and be aware of these fundamentals. One, driving is not a right. Two, driving is a privilege that comes with responsibilities. Three, driving is different. Driving is the only thing that most of us will ever do on a daily basis that has the ability to kill and injure self, friends, family, and even people we don't know. This section I call safe house. This information can make all new driving students a lot more comfortable about learning to drive with a parent or guardian. This is a combination of contract and team effort. Let me explain. It is no secret that parents and children sometimes have arguments and relationship issues. It's just a fact of life. So, we need to make any vehicle you teach your child to drive in a safe house. For example, if you're in the middle of any kind of argument or issue with your child, and then an hour later you are supervising their driving, safe house means that whatever it was that you were arguing about or discussing the hour before cannot be brought up at all in the vehicle by either of you. Supervised driving time is too important for distracting emotions to be involved. You are a team. You both have a responsibility to work on the safe house agreement. The adult or parent doing the driving supervision is always the second set of eyes. Remember, High emotions, anger and aggressiveness are all driving distractions. There is another important point in the safe house agreement. I would advise you to set up an alarm word that can remind you both that a subject is out of bounds. You can find any word that when said, both of you know to change the subject. Just one word. Use a word that makes sense. A word like cyclist would not be very useful in a driving situation. 
but a word such as strawberry could work well. This agreement should also work when the parent or guardian is driving. In other words, no arguments ever while driving. Now we need to add another important key to understanding if your child is ready to drive and also add a very important training tool for parents. I will now explain passenger driving commentary. You will see different parent, child and new driver participation in this section. There are several steps I need to go over here. Step 1. I will explain right seat or passenger side commentary. The setup for this is with an adult driving and the child in the passenger seat. The object of this exercise is for a parent to understand how the child is using their eyes and what they perceive and observe out on the road as the parent or guardian is driving. There are two basic questions you can ask them. What do you see that is potentially dangerous? Where could hidden danger come from? Have a talk about it before you go out driving so your child knows what to expect. Initially, the parent will drive and the new driver will listen to better understand how this works. After the child has a grasp of what commentary driving is all about, then they can start to commentate as the parent is driving and listening. Here is me giving an example of the type of commentary we would like to hear from the right seat. Be prepared. We've got the construction on the right here. There could be workers, there could be pedestrians getting around the construction, cars trying to look around the construction. You have to be aware. Cyclists there on the right, trucks in front, cars coming faster on the left. You be aware, you're ready, you're looking in your mirrors, you're glancing every five to seven seconds in those mirrors. You have to know what's coming from behind. You have cars coming straight down, two lanes, you have a traffic light, cars coming from the right, cars coming from the left from two or three different areas, three different side roads, side streets and parking lots, and people doing U-turns. There are huge blind spots here. Again, you anticipate that somebody's going to come between the cars. You're gonna, a child could run away from its mom between the cars, a pedestrian rushing or on the phone distracted. You've got a lady carrying a baby across the road there. You've got somebody opening their door here with the Range Rover on the right. A lot of pedestrians here, pedestrian area, a lot of restaurants. You have to anticipate a lot of danger here. People are looking for where they want to go. They're looking for a parking space. It's not a place to be distracted. This is exactly the type of commentary a parent would be hearing from the right seat if the child was doing a good job. John has only had his license for a short while and is still in high school. We sat down for a few minutes and I briefly explained passenger seat commentary driving. We then went out and after listening to me for less than five minutes, he had a go at commentary driving himself. Here is a part of it. There's a car coming this way, just past us. There's signs, blind driveways, left and right. There is a curve in the road. There's two driveways, no cars coming. There's signs that might block vision coming up. There's no traffic currently coming. There's cars parked, multiple signs and flags. There's a truck pulling out ahead, coming this way, taking a wide turn. There's blind driveways with signs in front. There's lots of trees and foliage. More signs, more parked cars, none of them appear to be moving. John did a great job. I asked him if he learned anything from our brief lesson. I definitely learned something. I mean, for the most part, I try to be very cautious and look around. And I realized I got to lift my eyes up, kind of look ahead a little bit because there's stuff that's not necessarily close that I need to pay attention to as well. I want to clarify how drivers see traffic situations. This can be broken down into three main areas an aware driver who is not distracted and is completely in the driving zone will see things in their central vision, their peripheral vision, and also use anticipation. Traffic situations that develop in our central vision are relatively easy to pick up as we drive, providing we are looking ahead and we are not mentally distracted in a phone call or in a conversation with a passenger. Traffic situations in our peripheral vision are much harder to pick up and require eye scanning, eyes up, and full attention. The most important skill I use on the roads is anticipation. The essential understanding for using anticipation is this. You will anticipate that any vehicle, pedestrian, cyclist, or whatever else you see around you as you drive will do the unexpected. For example, the car in front of you will suddenly stop. The guy waiting to pull out will do it right in front of you.
The driver of the vehicle behind you is texting and will not stop when you do. The person in the left lane will suddenly turn right. Anticipation while driving means always expecting the unexpected. By planning a way out or leaving enough space around your vehicle to stay clear. Let's listen as I use anticipation. We are coming from a green light. We are aware of our speed. We are doing mirror checks all the time. The car on our left is going a little faster. That car is coming. We now have a situation with a turn signal. Car going from the middle to the right. Car on the right. We're anticipating they're gonna pull out. We're anticipating the car ahead of us on the left will turn to the right. We're now coming up to a stop sign. We're looking in our mirrors, we're glancing in the mirrors, making sure that everybody's slowing down. If not everybody's slowing down, you've got to have an out. Everybody's going slowly, slowing down here. We're now at the red light. Cars behind us have stopped. We've anticipated the problems from behind. We have plenty of room. There really is no time to be distracted while driving. Hopefully it is now obvious that commentary driving trains new drivers how to use their eyes. The analysis of a collision chapter in part two clearly defines why it is so important for new drivers to have more time to see developing traffic situations. Please review that section at any time to help you. Using our central vision, peripheral vision, and anticipating problems takes full concentration for all drivers. It should now be obvious to anyone watching that any distraction will cut down or stop our potential to pick up danger earlier. The earlier we perceive change or danger that could enter into our driving space, the more time we have to react and avoid it. Key point, if the child does not want to participate in this exercise or does not take it seriously, then the parent knows the child will not be taking driving seriously and has the wrong attitude and is probably not ready to learn to drive yet. Please parents, no distractions at all while performing this exercise. Phones should be off, no music, no radio, no distractions at all. To summarize, if your child has a pretty good grasp of what they see and the potential dangers from the right seat, and their attitude has been positive and they were engaged through the whole commentary driving process, and they know the guardian principles of mobility, then you can consider and discuss signing off on their learner permit. After obtaining the learner's permit, parents and guardians have to arrange supervised driving time. If you make a date to drive with your child, please try very hard not to let them down. Remember, if you take this seriously, then there is a much greater chance they will. You may be the only driver education teacher your child has. Every parent should know that they have a very important responsibility and do the best they can, no matter how much driving education the child has. If indeed you are the only source for driver education, then of course, the responsibility on you is even greater to set good examples. So basically, I think all of us at one point were driving with our parents and it was very quiet and you're coming up to a stop sign or a traffic light and you're getting ready to go over to the brake pedal and your parents are screaming, brake, 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 slow, slow, slow. And you go, I know, I know, I see the stop sign, I see the traffic light. You were just doing it at your own rate and your own timing. So the whole point of the commentary driving is to give the person in the passenger seat that's helping you with driving to know what you're thinking, to know what you're looking at. So they don't have to say so much to you. You're basically explaining what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. So Andy really covered a lot of stuff. So hopefully you have a better uh, perspective of why the state has required parental driving with you and along with what you're getting here with driver's ed, because it will help. And hopefully your parents will encourage you to do safe driving techniques um, rather than uh, breaking laws and creating bad habits. So it'll be interesting when I do drive with you to see what kind of driver that you actually are. Um, driver's ed can be a little bit, um, you know, a downer. Uh, we are going to do some uh, research and some articles on different driving topics. And because we drive every day and we're driving a piece of machinery that can harm people, that we will be talking about 
injury. We'll be talking about death, but I will not be showing you any of these like death on the highway, you know, red asphalt. Some of the programs that have been around for years with driver's ed, um, I just don't think that they're that beneficial. But we will be talking about um, what happens if things go wrong. And the worst thing that could ever happen would be to lose a life. And I thought when I saw this, I said, oh, how, how a family must ache. It's bad enough to lose one individual in a car crash, but to lose a second son in a four-month period, I cannot imagine the pain and the grief. So we're trying to do everything that we can in driver's ed to make you think about what you're doing behind the wheel and to be safe. So we're going to be talking about safe cars, safety equipment, uh, driving techniques. Everything that can help protect you is going to be part of this program. Now, you can download this or write this down. You can go online to the App Store and get this. I used to have a hard copy, but the state hasn't provided me a hard copy of Road Ready anymore. You can actually track your hours, but... If you do track your hours on this app, you're going to have to print them out. They will not just allow you to show when you go for your license that you did your 40 hours. So it's a good way to, tr uh, to track your hours, but you've got to find a way to actually print it out. So that's the app. Um, this is the hard copy at the top. And then you could actually do a digital version that's on your laptop. But I, I think the best by far is the mobile application. And I'm not even sure. I think in the mobile application, they may even have a subcategory that's state of New Hampshire. And I think you can actually print out the 40-hour log there. So we've basically covered a lot um, in a short period of time tonight. So safe driving is a result of consistent practice of good driving skills and decision-making. There's nothing miraculous about the process. There is no luck involved. So whatever you practice will become a habit over time. The only difference between being a good driver or a bad driver is effort and attitude. I do want to show you one last thing about being vulnerable. So I do want you to uh, write this down. Andy's going to talk about being dangerous or being vulnerable sides to the distracted driving issue that all drivers need to understand and it revolves around overall awareness. If your eyes or mind are away from driving for some distraction then you are always either dangerous or vulnerable. Let me explain. Many drivers both experienced and new believe they are safe and doing nothing wrong. As okay they I want distracted. you to write down if you can believe in the comments dangerous and vulnerable so I know you're still here. Maintain their speed, stay in their lane etc. They actually tell me this as if they are above the distracted driving problem. I want to change this extremely dangerous perception right here. We've all seen or heard tragic stories about drivers hitting other vehicles head on. A driver who veers into another lane or into oncoming traffic is obviously completely unaware and dangerous. There is no doubt about that one, but let's look a little deeper. To the drivers who think they can successfully drive distracted, I explain this. You may think you can drive distracted and not be dangerous, but I know for certain you are vulnerable. Imagine for the sake of discussion that you were looking away from the road for a second or deep into your phone call, right at the moment an oncoming vehicle veered into your lane. Exactly. You would not see them at all if you were looking away or you would react much slower because you were distracted and your mind was deep into the phone call. Not good, huh? Research shows us that this is accurate. Every day this tragic scenario plays out on the roads. Bad choices followed by unfortunate timing. It takes two fully or partially distracted drivers coming together in most collisions and crashes. Never give up your chance to see distracted drivers coming into your driving space. I don't want you to be dangerous or vulnerable. And please, never with children in the vehicle. Many drivers, both experienced and new, are not respecting that driving is different. The potential downside to driving mistakes are well known to parents. Driving deserves more respect from all drivers. The cost of avoidable mistakes by new drivers is mind-numbing. 
We are talking avoidable heartbreak and billions in medical expenses, legal costs and property damage. There is a troubling trend I need parents to be aware of. Many teens are now waiting to take the driving test until they are 18 or 19 years of age. In most states, an 18 or 19 year old can walk into a DMV and take their driving test with no driver training whatsoever. This information should clearly be a wake up call to all parents. I definitely want to give a shout out to parents watching who take driving very seriously and never drive distracted, especially when there are children in the vehicle. The information and knowledge here has to be aimed at the majority of parents and adults who drive distracted every day. I made my second PSA truth to give non-distracted driving parents and adults respect and to also shine another light on the extent of the distracted driving problem. I just never thought my kid was paying that much attention to my driving. Let's take a look at truth. I have three wonderful children. They've learned everything else from me. Why would driving be any different? Driving deserves respect. If something had happened to my kid because they had been driving with a distraction that I know in my heart they had learned from me, I would never forgive myself. It's not enough to tell them. With driving, you have to show them the right way. Before I get into obstacles, I want to share a very important piece of data about exactly how long most people drive with their children in their vehicle. There are variables to consider such as age of the children, do the children go to daycare or school, one and two parent homes, etc. But the average amount of time parents spend ferrying their children around is usually between 10 and 30 hours a month. The average driver is in their car for 70 to 90 hours a month. Please make sure you drive distraction-free at all times, but especially when your children are in the vehicle. So, let's check out the obstacles. Well, distractions have been around a while. I'm going to explain why smartphones and smart devices are being singled out for so much discussion and new laws against their use while driving. Eating a burger and phone use are both driving distractions that cause vehicle collisions and crashes every day. But there is a very important difference between the many driving distractions such as eating a burger and the use of smartphones while driving. This difference is critical to understanding the whole distracted driving issue, and that is frequency. You don't spend hours eating a burger as you drive, but people do spend hours talking on the phone. The huge problem for new drivers is that they spend five to seven hours on their smartphones per day, but it's not phone calls for them, it's texting, email, updating message boards, etc. It's now reached four to 5,000 text messages a month for the average 14-year-old, and it's going up all the time. This texting or typing reality is exactly why all parents and adults need to separate their phone use from driving when children are in the vehicle. If parents consistently separate driving from phone use, then over time, children will see that driving is different and that smartphone use must wait. If adults don't separate their use of a smartphone while driving with their children in the car, then there is little to no chance their child will put the phone away as they start to drive. Remember, it's not enough just to tell them, you have to show them the If I had a dollar. So basically, we learn so much from our parents. So it will be interesting when I do get you behind the wheel to see what your habits are. What have they let go? What have they encouraged you to do? Uh, so I don't want to be disrespectful to what parents have told you to do. So when you drive with your parents, of course, you're going to obey and do what your parents tell you to do. 
But eventually, you're going to hear what I say, what your parents say, what your friends do, and you're going to come up with your own style about driving. Of course, you don't want to break any laws, but there's a lot of technique and style to driving. So you're going to come up with what's best for you. But certainly, when you're being distracted, you're either dangerous or vulnerable, and, and we just don't want that to happen. So I believe... That is it. That is usually when I end the program. Take a break is usually when I do a two-hour course. We're almost at this point right here. So I'm going to flip out of this. Let's talk about what you've got for tomorrow. So chapter one, question. So what I'd like you to do is on a blank piece of paper, write down your answers and then take a picture of those answers and send it to me. So your contact in my phone is really your file. So you've sent your birth certificate, you've sent that driving log to me. Um, so that's where I keep everything. So when I look at your name, I can just scroll up or down and see what you've provided me. Okay, rather than having papers all over the place, I can keep everything right on my phone. So text messages for homework is the way to go. All right, take a picture of it and send it. So chapter one after tomorrow's class will be due. So read it because we'll be covering most of it in class and uh, section one in the manual. So if you've got any questions about tonight, feel free to give me a text. Um, I want you to sign out. Uh, once I get off the computer right here, just say, um, I'm leaving. That means that you've been here for the whole time. So it looks like everybody 